Speaking of Joe Rogan, I, I think that Jamie, his producer, is uh, immune to uh, uh, psychedelic. <laughs> so maybe yeah, he's a, he's a good recruit for the study to to test. So that's interesting. Now I'm not the caveat is I'm not encouraging anything illicit, but just theoretically. My first question as a far behavioral pharmacologist is like, you know, increase the dose. Increase like, the dose. You know, like really. Nobody's let's see the full dose. I'm not <laughs> yeah. telling him Jamie to do that, but like, <laughs> okay, like you know, you're taking the same amount that friends might be taking, but yeah. But he he was also referring to the psychedelic effects of edible marijuana, which is is there is there uh, rules on uh, dosage for um, uh, edible like marijuana? Is there limits? Like what places where it's this is this all goes to, it probably is state by state, right? It is, but most they've gone that direction and, and states that didn't initially have these rules have not, now have them. Yeah. So it was like you'll get, I think, you know, five, ten mil I think ten five or ten milligrams of, of THC yeah. being a, a common and, and and like and this is an important thing, like where they've moved from not being allowed to say, like have a whole candy bar and have each of the eight or ten squares on the candy bar being ten milligrams but it's like no the whole thing because like you know someone gets a candy bar they, they're eating the freaking candy bar yeah and it's like if you unless you're a daily cannabis user if you if you take you know 100 milligrams it's like that's what could lead to a bad trip yeah for someone and it's like you know a lot of these people it's like oh you used to, used to smoke a little weed in college they might say they're visiting denver for a business trip and they're like why not let's give it a shot you know yeah. and they're like oh i don't want to smoke something because it's going to be... so i'm going to be safer with this edible yeah. <laughs> they like yes. consume this massive you know yeah. but there's huge tolerance so a regular like for someone who's smoking weed every day they might take 5 milligrams and kind of hardly feel anything and they might not, may not, they may really need something more like 30 40 50 milligrams to have a strong effect but yeah so that's they've evolved in terms of the rules about like, okay, what constitutes a dose, yes. you know, which is why you see less big candy bars and more, or if you're is, you're, if it is a whole candy bar, you're only getting a smaller dose, like 10 milligrams or yeah. Cause that's, is where people get in trouble more often with edibles. Yeah. Uh, except Joey Diaz, which I've heard. This, uh, that's definitely somebody I want to talk to. Out of the crazy comedians, I want to talk to him as well. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, fifteen. the study of the 15 and uh, the dose not being a question. So like, what was the recruitment based on? What was the, uh, like, how did the study get conducted? Yeah, so the recruitment, I really liked this fact. It wasn't people that, you know, largely were, you know, we were honest about what we were studying, but for most people, it was, they were in the category of like, you know, not particularly interested in psychedelics, but mm -hmm. more of like, they want to quit smoking. They've tried everything but the kitchen sink. Yeah. And this sounds like the kitchen sink. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's like, well, it's Hopkins. So, yeah. you know, thinking oh, that sounds like it's safe enough. So, yeah. like, what the hell? Let's give it a shot. Like, most of them were, were in that category, which I really, you know, I, I appreciate because it's more of a, of a test, you yeah. know, of, 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 yeah, just like m a better model of what, if these are approved as medicines, yeah. like what you're going to have the average participant, you know, um, uh, be like. And so the, the, the therapy involves a, a good amount of, of non psilocybin sessions so preparatory sessions, like eight hours of, of getting to know the person, like the two people who are going to be their guides or the person in the room with them during the experience, um, uh, having these discussions with them where you're both kind of rapport building, just kind of discussing their life, getting to know them. Um, but then also telling them, preparing them about the, the, the psilocybin experience. Oh, it could be scary in this sense, but well, here's how to handle it. Trust, let go, be open. Um, and also during that preparation time, preparing them to quit smoking, using really standard bread and butter techniques that are, can all fall under the label typically of the cognitive behavioral therapy, just stuff like before you quit, we assign a target quit date ahead of time. You're not just quitting on the fly. Um, and, and that happens to be the target quit date in our study was the day that where they got the first psilocybin dose. But doing things like keeping a smoking diary, like, okay, during the three weeks until you quit, every time you smoke a cigarette, just like jot down what you're doing, what you're feeling, mm -hmm. what situation, that type of thing. And then having some discussion around that. And then going over the pluses and minuses in their life that smoking kind of comes with and being honest about the, this is what it does for me. This is why I like it. This is why I don't like it. Preparing for like, what if you, what if you do slip, how to handle it? Like don't dwell on guilt because that leads to more 
full on relapse, you know, just kind of treat it as a learning experience, that type of thing. Then you have the real, the session day where they come in, they, they, um, five minutes of questionnaires, but pretty much they jump into the, we, we touch base with them and they, we, we, we give them the capsule. It's a serious setting, but you know, uh, a comfortable one. They're in a room that looks more like a living room than like a research lab. We measure their blood pressure, they experience, but kind of minimal kind of medical vibe to it. And, um, they lay down on a couch and it's, a, it's a purposefully an introspective experience. So they're laying on a couch during most of the, uh, five to six hour experience and they're wearing eye shades, which is a better connotation as a name than blindfold, <laughs> but like, you know, so they're wearing eye shades, but that's, and, and, and they're wearing headphones through which music is played. Um, mostly classical, although we've done some variation of that. I have a paper that was recently accepted, kind of comparing it to more like gongs and 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 mm. harmonic bowls and and that type of thing, kind of like sound, you know, kind of um Yeah, you, you you've uh you've also added this to the science and have a paper on the musical accompaniment to the psychedelic experience. That's fascinating. Right. And we found basically that the about the same effect, even by a trend not significant, but a little bit better of an effect, both in terms of um, subjective experience and long term, whether it helped people quit smoking, just a little tiny non significant trend, even favoring the 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 novel playlist with the the Tibetan singing bowls and and the gongs and all, didgeridoo and all of that. And um, so so anyway, just saying, okay, we we can deviate a little bit from this, like what goes back to the 1950s of this method of using classical music as part of this psychedelic therapy. But they're listening to the music and they're not playing DJ in real time. You know, it's like you know they're to just be the baby. You're not the decision maker for today. Go inward. Trust, let go, be open. And pretty much the only interaction like that we're there for is to deal with any anxiety that comes up. So guide is kind of a misnomer in a sense. It's we're more of a safety net. And so like tell us if you feel some butterflies so that we can provide reassurance. A hold of their, their hand can be very powerful. I've had people tell me that that was like the thing that really just grounded them. Can you break apart trust, let go, be open? What, uh, what, so in a sense, how would you describe the experience, the uh, intellectual and the emotional approach that people are supposed to take to really let go into the experience? Yeah, so you know, trust is, trust the context, you know, trust the guides, trust the overall in institutional context, I see it as layers of like safety, even though it's yeah. everything I told you about the relative bodily safety of psilocybin. Nonetheless, we're still getting blood pressure throughout the session mm -hmm. just in case. We have a physician on hand who can respond just in case. Mm -hmm. We're literally across the street from the emergency department just in case, you know, all of that, you know. Privacy is another thing you've talked about, just trusting that you're. And whatever happens is just between you and and the people in the study. Right. And hopefully they've really gotten that by that point deep into the study that like they realize we're we take that seriously and everything else, you know. And so it's really kind of like a very special role you're playing as a as a researcher or guide and and hopefully they have your your trust. And so, you know, and trust that they could be as emotional, everything from laughter to tears, like that's gonna be welcomed. We're not judging them. It's like a, it's a therapeutic relationship right. where you know, this is a safe container. It's a safe yeah. space. Safe that space. has a lot of baggage to that term, but it truly <laughs> is. It's a safe yeah. space for that, for this type of ex experience and to, to let go. So trust, let's see, let go. So that relates to the emotional, like you feel like crying, cry. Mm -hmm. You feel like laughing your ass off, laugh your ass off. You know, it's like all the things actually that sometimes it's more challenging with a recreate, someone has a large recreational use. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's harder for them because- People in that context, and understandably so, it's more about holding your shit. Yeah. Someone's had a bunch of mushrooms at a party. Maybe they don't want to go into the back room and start crying about this, these thoughts about the relationship mm -hmm. with their mother. And they don't want to be the drama queen or king that bring their friends down because their friends are having an experience too. And so they want to like compose. Yeah. You know, and um, also just the appearance in social settings versus the so like prioritizing how you appear to others versus the prioritizing the depth of the experience. And well, here in the study, you can prioritize the experience, right? And it's all about like you're the astronaut, and we're there's only one astronaut, yeah, we're ground control. And I use this often with um, that's good. I have a 
the photo of the space shuttle on a plaque in my in my office and i kind of use often use that as an example it's like we're here for you like we're a team but yeah. we have different roles it's just like yeah. you don't have to like compose yourself like you don't have to like be concerned about our safety like we're playing these roles today and like yeah your job is to go as deep as possible or as far out whatever your analogy is like as possible and and we're keeping you you safe and so yeah and you really the emotional side is a hard one you, you know because you really want people to like if they go into realms of subjectively of, of despair and sorrow you, like yeah like cry you know like it's okay you know and especially if someone's a, you know more macho and you know you you want this to be the place where they they can let go yeah. and 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 again something that they wouldn't or shouldn't do if someone tr- was to theoretically use it in a in a social setting and, and like and also these other things like even that you get in those so- social settings of like yeah you don't have to like worry about your wallet or yeah, being yeah. taken advantage or for especially for a woman sexually assaulted by some yeah. creep at a concert or something because they're in, you know they're laying down being there's like far a million out sources of anxiety that are external uh, versus internal so you can just focus on your own like right the, the in, beautiful thing that's going on in your mind and even the cops at that layer, layer even yes, though it's extremely right. unlikely yeah for most people that cops yeah. would come in and bust them right when, like even at that theoretical, like that yeah. one in a billion chance, like that might be a real thing psychologically. Yeah. In this context, we even got that covered. Yeah. This is, a, we've got DEA approval. Yeah. <laughs> like you are, this is okay by yeah. every level of society yeah. that counts, you know, that yeah. has the authority. So it's, so go deep, trust the, you know, trust the setting, trust yourself, um, you know, let go. And be open. So in the experience, and this is all subjective and by analogy, but like if there's a door, open it, go into it. If there's a, a stairwell, go down it or a stairway, go up it. If there's a monster in the mind's eye, you know, don't run, approach it, look it in the eye and say, you know, let's talk. Read it. <laughs> yeah. What's up? What are you doing here? Let's talk turkey, you know? <laughs> Dave and I Goggins thought, entered the chat. Okay. <laughs> right, right. It really is that. It that really is a heart of a heart of it. This, this radical courage. Like yeah, it courage. People are often struck by that coming out. Like this is heavy lifting. This is hard work. People come out of this exhausted. And it's it can be extremely some people say it's the most difficult thing they've done in their life. Like choosing to let go on a moment, a microsecond by microsecond. Mm-hmm basis everything in their inclination is to is to say stop sometimes stop this i don't like this i didn't know it was going to be like this this is too much and terence mckenna put it this way it's like comparing to meditation and other techniques it's like spending years push trying to press the accelerator to make something happen high dose psychedelics is like you're speeding down the the mountain in a fully loaded semi truck and you're you're charged with not slamming the brake <laughs> it's like you know let it happen, you know, so it's very difficult and to engage, always, you know, go further into it and take that radical, you know, radical courage, you know, throughout. What do they say um, in self-report, if you can put general words to it, what is their experience like? What do they say it's like? Because these are many people, like you said, that haven't probably read much about psychedelics or they don't have like with Joe Rogan, like language or stories to put on it. So this is very raw self-report of experiences. Is uh, What do they say the experience is like? Yeah, and some more so than others because everyone has been exposed at some level or another, right. but some, some it is pretty superficial as you're, as you're saying. Um, one of the hallmarks of psychedelics is just their variability. So I'm more struck, it's mm. like not the mean, but the standard deviation right. so, is yeah. so wide that it's like it could be, like hellish experiences and and you, you know um just absolutely beautiful and loving experiences everything in between and and both of those like those could be 2 minutes apart from each other yeah and, and sometimes kind of at the same at the same time concurrently so um let's see there's different ways to there were some Jungian psychologists back in the 60s, um, Masters in Houston, that wrote a really good book, The Varieties of Psychedelic Experience, kind of, which is a play on varieties of religious experience by William James, mm-hmm. uh, th- that they described a, a, this a perceptual level. So most people have that, you know, when, you know, whether they're looking at the room without the eye shades on or inside their 
in their mind's eye with the eye shades on colors, you know, um, sounds like this is, is a much richer um, sensorium, mm-hmm. you know, so, which can be very interesting. And then at another level, a uh, master's in Houston and called that the psychodynamic level. And I think you could think about it more broadly than that, you know, that's kind of Jungian, but um, just the personal psychological levels, how I think of it, like, this is about your life. There's a whole life review. Oftentimes people have thoughts about their childhood, about their relationships, their their spouse or partner, um, their children, their parents, their family of origin, their current family. Like, you know, that stuff comes up a lot, including every, like, like the love, just people just like pouring with tears about like, like how much, like it hits them so hard how much they love people. Yeah. Like in a way that, you know, for people that like they'd love their family, but like it just hits them so hard that like yeah. how important this is yeah. and like the magnitude of that love and like what that means in their life. So that's, those are some of the most moving experiences to be present for is where people like it hits home, like what really matters in their life. And, and, and then you have this sort of what Masters in Houston called the archetypal realm which kind of, again is sort of Jungian with the focus on archetypes, w- 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 which is interesting, but I think of that more generally as like symbolic level. Mm-hmm. So just really deep experiences where you have, you do have experiences that seem symbolic of, you know, very mm-hmm. much in like, you know, what we know about dreaming and what most people think about dreaming, like there's this randomness of things, but sometimes it's pretty clear in retrospect, oh, like this came up because this thing has been on my mind you know, recently. So it seems to be, there, there seems to be this symbolic level. And then they have this, the last level that they describe is the mystical integral level, which, and this is where there's lots of terms for it, but transcendental experiences, experiences of unity, mystical type effects we often you know, measure. Um, Europeans use a scale that will refer to oceanic boundlessness. This is all pretty <laughs> much the same thing. Yeah, This is like, at some sense, the deepest level of the very sense of self seems to be dissolved, minimized, or expanded such that the boundaries of the self go into, and here, I think some of this is just semantics, but whether the self is expanding such that there's no boundary between the self and the rest of the universe, or whether there's no sense of self, again, might be just semantics, but this radical shift or sense of loss of of sense of self or self boundaries. And that's like the most, typically when people have that experience, they'll often report that as being the most remarkable thing. And this is what you don't typically get with MDMA, these deepest levels of the the nature of reality itself, the subjectivity and objectivity, just like the 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 seer and the seen become one and, and, and it's a process. And yeah. And they're able to bring that experience back uh, and be able to describe it. Yeah, but but one of the, to a degree, but one of the hallmarks, going back to William James, of describing a mystical experience is the ineffability. Mm. And so even though it's ineffable, you know, people try as far as they can to describe it. But when you get the real deal, they'll say, and even say that though they say a lot of helpful things to help you describe the landscape, they'll say, no matter what I say, I'm still not even coming anywhere close to what this was. Like the language is completely failing. And I like to joke that even though it's it's ineffable, and we're researchers, so we try to f it up by asking them to describe the experience. <laughs> but, I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. But uh, to bring it back a little bit, so for that particular study on uh, tobacco, what was the results? What was the conclusions in terms of the uh, impact of uh, psilocybin on their addiction? So in that pilot study, it was very, it was a very small and it wasn't a, a randomized study, so it was limited. The only question we could really answer was, is this worthy enough of follow-up? Yes. And the a- answer to that was absolutely, because <laughs> the success rates were so high, 80% biologically confirmed successful at six m- months. That held up to 60% biologically confirmed abstinent at two and, at an average of two and a half years, a very two long and a half follow-up. Years. Wow. Yeah. And so- I mean, the, the best that's been reported in the literature for smoking cessation is in the upper 50%. And that's with not one, but two medications for a couple of months, followed by regular cognitive behavioral therapy where you're coming in once a week or once every few weeks for an entire year. And, and so- But, but you know, this like is what- Very the, heavy. And 
This is just like a few uses of uh, psilocybin? So this was three doses of psilocybin over a total course, including preparation, everything, a 15-week period where there's mainly like, um, uh, for most part, one one meeting a week, and then the three sessions are within that. And so it's, and we scale that back in the more... The, the, the study we're doing right now, which I can tell you about, which is a randomized um, controlled trial. Um, but but it's uh, the, yeah, the, the original, um, you know, pilot study was, you know, these 15 people. So given the, like the positive signal from the first study telling us that it was a worthy pursuit, we hustled up some money to actually be able to afford a larger trial. So it's randomizing 80 people to to get either one psilocybin session when we've narrowed we we've scaled that down from three to, to one mainly because we're doing fmri neuroimaging before and after and it made it more experimentally complex to have multiple sessions um but one psilocybin session versus uh the uh, nicotine patch using the the fda approved label like standard use of the nicotine patch so it's randomized 40 people get randomized to psilocybin one session 40 people get nicotine patch and they all get the same cognitive behavioral therapy sort of the standard talk therapy. And we've scaled it down somewhat. So there's less uh, weekly meetings, but it's within the same ballpark. And right now we're still, um, uh, 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 the study's still ongoing. And in fact, we just recently started recruiting again. We paused for COVID. Now we're starting back up with some protections like masks and whatnot. But, um, uh, Right now, for the 44 people who have gotten through the one-year follow-up, and so that includes 22 from each of the two groups, the success rates are extremely high. For the psilocybin group, it's 59% have been biologically confirmed as smoke-free at one year after their quit date. Mm -hmm. And that compares to uh, 27% for the nicotine patch, which, by the way, is extremely good for the nicotine patch compared to previous research. So... The results could change because it's ongoing, but we're mostly done and it's still looking extremely positive. So if anyone's interested, they have to be sort of be in commuting distance to the Baltimore area, but you know- To participate. Right, right, to participate.